it that the oceans mattered at all growing up. <laughs> and so it was kind of striking to me to find out that, oh, wait, this is a really important shared resource for the global community, provides um, food, oxygen, and balances all these budgets that exist. And when you are in Ohio, you don't know those things. You guys live in Florida, you know what's what. But a lot of people, that information doesn't exist. And so this is why I'm working on what I'm working on, what motivates me is both understanding and then communicating the importance of the ocean to uh, people. And specifically, my research focus is sort of embedded in this broad framework. And I'm working in the age of climate change. And so all of my questions have some linkage back to trying to understand what the future of our systems is going to look like. And I started out really looking at how organisms handle variation in their environment. Sometimes we so anthropomorphize and call that stressful conditions, but you know, for, for a lot of organisms, this is just variation in the natural environment, um, and it can change both behavior and physiology of organisms, and I want to understand that and um, move towards predictive understanding. Um, from there, what I really wanted to see is what are the consequences of those changes, okay? Looking at uh, changes in biodiversity, whether that's at species level, subpopulations, genotypes, those kinds of changes. I do that mostly by collaboration. I'm not going to talk too much about that today. But I also want to understand how these changes influence ecosystem function. And specifically, I've been looking at uh, carbon transport and food webs. I'm going to focus mostly on carbon transport today. And the reason we want to talk about these things is because they can cause climate feedbacks, modify the influences of climate change on the organisms, and you get these cyclical cycles. And we all, of course, what's the future going to look like? for our children. I've got two small children, so this like keeps me up at night, right? And the organisms that I work on are the zooplankton. And I pretty much exclusively started on the beautiful pteropods. <laughs> and then I've gotten sidetracked into the copepods, which is what my husband studies, and it's what everybody else cares about because there's more of them, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they're cool, <laughs> copepods. But there's a great diversity of organisms out there, and I think it's important to recognize that that variability matters, and it's worth studying not just the numerically dominant organisms, but also the range of functional and biological diversity that's out there. Okay, and so this talk is going to focus on zooplankton con on contributions to biogeochemistry. And this is a little pictogram that I've used to sort of explain what I mean when I'm talking about that. Okay? When we talk about the movement of carbon that's fixed by phytoplankton in the surface waters via photosynthesis, it's moving to depth and being exported out. And there's five-ish nominal pathways by which that happens. Two of those pathways are mediated exclusively by the zooplankton. One of them is the particulate organic carbon, poop. Okay. This is fecal pellet production of the zooplankton in the surface waters. It sinks out passively um, and is a major component of flux. The other part is called um, active flux or the biological pump. So this is the migration of zooplankton who spend their nights uh, in the darkness, in the food environment of the surface. Um, but then at daytime, they swim to depth. They're nominally avoiding, probably avoiding um, uh, predation by visual predators. They're coming down, and then they are releasing components that are derived from that phytoplankton in the midwater. And those components are a number of different things. We've got the dissolved organic matter, the particulate organic carbon, fecal pellets, and carbon dioxide. And so these biogeochemical components, I'm just talking about carbon today, there's also lots of like nitrogenous components as well, um, have really strong implications for the food web, um, particularly in the midwater. They can go down there and start consuming particles that are in the midwater, um, repackaging things, eating each other. Um, and, and so this migration really matters. And again, the food, the stuff that sinks out of this ocean, is the food for everything else in, in, in the water column, right? So the mesopelagic, the bathypelagic, is fed by this export flux from the surface waters, and much of the benthos is also just waiting desperately for manna from heaven. Um, and so my current research directions, the three topics I'm going to look at today are how do we particularly our estimates of active flux? What is that, Dom? And does it matter? And is there other physiology we should be considering. And I suppose that's sort of disingenuous. Of course there's other physiology we should be uh, considering, or I wouldn't have put it up there. So step one, active flux. As I said, this is one of the five pathways by which carbon moves from the surface water to depth. Um, and it's, it's 
arguably and has been argued to be the worst studied of the flux um, processes because it's just so bloody difficult to do. Um, you're not actually catching anything in a particle trap. It's just the respiratory CO2 of these migratory organisms. And that's hard to disentangle from things like apparent oxygen utilization in the midwater because there's other things that are they're going on. Figuring out the zooplankton contribution to that is tricky. One of the standard methods is basically you take a net through the euphotic zone during the day, take a net through the euphotic zone during the night, subtract, and assume that that's the biomass that migrated. You apply some coefficients of temperature and size, and you call it good. You say that's the respiration that those migratory organisms are doing at depth. Um, this is a graph from Steinberg and Landry, who did a nice review of the active flux. Um, and if you take just this mean migrant biomass, which is this component, you apply these sorts of calculations, and then you actually look at the measured respiratory flux, we do a terrible job of capturing what's going on here. We've got 40% uncertainty in these measurements. So we can fix that. We can work on that. But to work on that, we need to think about what the potential problems might be. Um, and so some of the things that I think are valuable is understanding that the vertical extent of migration matters, OK? This is a data set from the Cal Coffee um, system. So what happened is they, they took the size of a copepods um, and looked at the vertical habitat of these organisms, comparing the night, which is the black, and the day, which is the white. OK, things that are cool that you see that come out of this is if you're really small, it's too hard to swim, and the critters can't really see you that well, so don't bother. And if you're really big, although you're a pretty good swimmer, you're so visible that even in moonlight, the surface waters aren't a great habitat. And then you get this range of swimming, of, of vertical depth of migration. Um, if you look at it here, this is the amplitude of vertical migration. So there's like a sweet spot, like halfway size copepods swim the most. Um, and what we've recognized is that the reason, in part, that it's important to, to analyze why the depth of migration is important is if you move 50 meters, a mixing event is much more likely to re-entrain that water, bring it back to the surface, re-expose all that CO2 that you've moved down back up to the surface. The deeper you go, the more likely that that CO2 is sequestered. So there was recently a, um, a modeling effort to look at how depth and use of, like putting migration into the model, like literally this was like, Maybe, maybe we should think about migration. Oh my god. Okay, so they've taken the model, they've added migration. And it's important. And the depth of migration is one of the things that is most important in tuning that model. Okay, so what do we know about the depth of migration other than just size? Because if you just knew size, you could just plug it all in. Well, not exactly. If anyone's seen any talks by Brad, you will know that the midwater environment also can constrain the migration of organisms. So this is work from a cruise that I went on as part of my graduate work, thanks to Brad and to Kendra for securing me the money for this work. And what I was doing is I was looking specifically for the depth distribution of pteropods, these adorable little guys, um, in regions with uh, the black line is really low oxygen or ridiculously low oxygen. The light colors are the daytime habitat. The dark colors are the nighttime habitat. Um, and what you can see from this data set is that um, some species don't care how bad uh, low oxygen is. And we're talking low oxygen like less than 10 micromoles. Like there's nothing there to breathe. Um, some organisms migrate when the oxygen is low, but not at all if it gets stupid low. And some organisms are completely absent from places where, it's, where there's no oxygen, OK? Not only then does it affect the species composition and the depth to which organisms are actively migrating, causing habitat compression or change in species composition, but the organisms that do migrate have changes in their physiology, OK? So it's impacting where they go, and it's also impacting how much of that CO2 they're releasing. So these are um, comparisons of organisms who are held at high oxygen versus low oxygen. These are different species, and I apologize. The colors do not correlate, and there's a different species on here. But going back to my graduate work was going to be hard to get you something perfect. I've gotten better at this. Um, <laughs> and so if you look at the percent control of oxygen consumption, you're seeing a 70 um, to, I think this was 55% reduction in the amount of oxygen consumed. And then corollary is the CO2 produced during respiration. 
low oxygen conditions, and it also changes um, the ratio of oxygen to nitrogen. So the inputs of these migratory organisms at depth are different than they would have been if uh, there had been no hypoxia at water. Okay, so how do we put that into big system models? Well, um, what people are starting to do is looking at acoustics data sets and trying to see how habitat compression occurs. That only about sort of major classifications because there are specialist organisms that move into these zones and it doesn't tell us anything about the physiology. There's a lot of work going on here at USL and elsewhere looking at what actually happens to the physiology under these low oxygen conditions. So we're starting to move in the direction of getting a, a mechanistic understanding uh, of what's happening there. Uh, but a lot of that is still constrained by, um, remember, most of what we do right now is just biomass day versus night. And the identity of those organisms matter. There are some organisms who are particularly good at dealing with hypoxia and some organisms that are not. This is data from the similar cruises. Um, what I've done is I've broken up the water column into sort of environments based on depth and oxygen profiles. Okay, so mixed layer down to this is our oxygen minimum zone region. Um, and then a suboxycline, which is sort of mesopelagic, starting to be slightly more oxygenated. Those correspond to these colors going down, and you can see the proportion of uh, composition that's made up by particular phylogenetic groupings. Okay? So there's groups that are typically found much more in the upper water column. There are oxygen minimizone specialists, organisms that handle low oxygen really well. They are found in those zones. They're going to contribute to the, the physiology there. And then there's organisms that are much more likely to be found below the oxygen minimum zone. So these organisms have different vital rates. They're responding to um, the environment differently, different density to low oxygen, and different feeding types, right? Kind of matters whether the midwater organisms are going to be chewing down on the, the fecal pellets coming down, or whether they're eating each other, or if they're suspension feeders, et cetera. So this functional diversity matters when we start trying to make estimates of how carbon is going to be modified going through these systems. Can you graph on the right? Which one's yes. temperature? Uh, yes, correct, yes, sorry. Okay, so the current way that I'm trying to do this is I'm trying to take um, vertically stratified toes, so this is using a mock nest uh, system, so this is the kind of net that drags a net through, uh, drags a net through the water at a certain depth, then at the next depth, and the next depth, and it tells you about the environmental characteristics of each of those regions. So I know what the oxygen is, I know what the temperature is from each of these depths. I bring the organisms back to the lab. Some of them are preserved for um, barcoding, so I can do molecular techniques to find out who they are. By That's a very royal eye. Uh, there are other people who do that for me, specifically my husband. Um, <laughs> and then we are using a ZO scan, which is basically a waterproof scanner that can get you 4,800 DPI. You pour the, the zooplankton into a tray, painstakingly separate the images so that the computer can see that they're different particles, close the lid, take an image, wait 15 minutes for the scanner to be done, and then the, the software picks out each particle, recognizes that it's different, and gives you lengths and width measurements, and then using the elliptical cow rather than the spherical cow, we can assume um, both area and volume measurements for these organisms. And from this, we can start to see patterns in the nighttime and daytime distribution. Okay, so these are paired day-night toes. These are the depth strata from which we're um, collecting organisms. And again, these were chosen to follow hydrographic parameters. And each of these bins is a histogram, a frequency of the number of particles that was that volume. Okay? So at night, everybody's up in the surface. The larger guys tend to be less to the surface than the smaller guys. This follows that, um, be, that pattern that we saw from uh, the cow coffee. Um, so the bigger you are, you don't go up as, as far. In the daytime, we see organisms moving down. The smaller guys don't move as far down. The bigger guys move down. And we have this down to 1,000, but my slide is not long enough. And so then you can start doing fun magic with these data sets. So these are my migrators, which is really just night versus day. And you can start to see those migrations where organisms specifically are going. So these are the small size class, these are the large size class. And again, if you go deeper, the bigger guys are moving also from much deeper. 
one thing that's nice about this is previously we just do night minus day at the surface and that's we call it good. But with this, we can start looking at the resident population. How many organisms are there constitutively all the time? How are those zooplankton influencing the, the community composition? And, and so this is our attenuation component, right? These guys are going to have different properties. Carnivores are not going to contribute to attenuation, so you need to know who they are. But all of these guys are also going to contribute to apparent oxygen utilization in the midwater. Okay? This is the resident zooplankton communities. We don't usually talk about these guys. I think we should be. So to talk about those things, to take it to the next level, though, you need to understand those metabolic rates, right? Um, both for active flux and for what the resident community is doing. And so we've got a couple options for physiology. One, we can take individual organisms out of the ocean, put them in little chambers, measure their oxygen consumption under relevant hydrographic parameters, um, and then scale those results to the ecosystem based on counts. We can alternatively take the entire community from a certain depth, squish it up, measure its enzyme activity from something called the electron transport system, um, and say this is the metabolism of that region. Finally, we could just count the organisms and use pre-existing size and temperature scaling estimates and call it good. All of these methods suck for different reasons. <laughs> okay? So you can only measure a couple critters. You're not going to get all the variation. Salps do not like being put in jars. Tinafores don't like being collected in nets. There's problems, right? ETS actually measures maximum potential respiration. Okay? It's how much you could go if you're going all out. Who goes all out all the time? I know sometimes it looks like I go out all the time, but it's not true. I do sleep at night. <laughs> and finally, size and temperature scaling approximations. These are conglomerations of all sorts of data sets put together. They give us sort of a good fit, but they might not be describing the physiological variability that's occurring in our particular system. So my response to this is, Let's do them all and let that constrain the uncertainty of our measurements. So this is part of um, the Exports Project, which is a big NASA project. We had two boats out to sea in the North Pacific um, in the fall of last year, as well as gliders. What? We had everything. If you can put it in the water, we put it in the water. Um, and then we're having another cruise in 2020 that will be in the North Atlantic. This provides two contrasting environments, one that is known to be very high flux and one that is known to be very low flux. Um, and I'm using similar things in Bermuda to give us an, an intermediate. And so what this is, is this is the data for my individual respirations. I've taken a zooplankton, put it in a glass bottle, let it do its thing for 12 hours, and I'm measuring how much oxygen it's consuming then calculating how much CO2 it's releasing. Then I'm also measuring how much dissolved organic carbon it's excreting into the water. Okay? So these are paired. These are um, from the same individuals. At the end, I then weigh the organism. And with that weight, I can go into the literature and say, based on our scaling, what should the respiration rate be and what should the dissolved organic carbon be and I can do this based on different taxonomic groups so the different taxonomic groups are the different colors note that there's only an n of two for the DOC we're working on it that machine is totally overloaded with samples but there'll be more here it gives us some nice ideas about patterns though the one to one line if the predicted is equaling the measured you're gonna follow this dotted line so you can see that actually we do okay with some of the taxonomic groups with other taxonomic groups, we don't do as well. They're not falling that close to the one-to-one -one line, um, and it's relatively consistent within the group. So what's interesting about this is that I specifically ran these experiments at in situ environment, and in the North Pacific, that means under relatively reduced oxygen concentrations. So I was starting my experiments at 70% air saturation. They ran down to about... 30, I think, was where I did the, my cutoff. So these are low oxygen experiments, but these organisms still have relatively high metabolisms uh, and no change in metabolic rate over the duration of those experiments. Um, the dissolved organic carbon estimates are based off of a paper in 2000 um, by Deb Steinberg, who is my co-PI on this project, and Craig Carlson, who's doing my current DOC measurements. And they predicted about 24% of total you can see that our, our DOC estimates are 
not doing a good job of measuring how much DOC is in the water column. And in some ways, that's reasonable. Our, our, our technology, particularly for DOC, has advanced a lot in the past few years. And this is the, f I won't say it is the first. I have not seen paired respiration DOC on single individual zooplankters of this size before. So we're getting a different level of experiment here. And this is valuable information because it tells us where our scaling coefficients are not working uh, and where we need more information to improve the model. This is our ETS measurements, okay? So again, we've taken the entire community, we've squished it up, we've measured their enzyme activity, and we've used that a proxy for how much ATP they can use over time and how much CO2 that ends up producing, okay? And these are vertically stratified, so this is numbers from uh, ETP uh, converted to CO2, and this is the daytime versus the nighttime. They're by the depth <coughs> strata. This is what we're calling the euphotic zone. This is what we're calling the twilight zone. So anything that moves from here to there is called flux, okay? Um, this is a subtraction. Um, so then to get to flux to do subtractions, you actually have to go to meter squared, blah, 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 blah. The long story short, it's about 270 micromoles of carbon per meter squared per day. This is a bit of an underestimate. We, after the fact, realized that we had a whole bunch of frozen salps that we hadn't added to our biomass measurement. So there's more here. There's more happening. Salps are pain. Um, but, in it, but even with that knowledge, this is a relatively low number. That's not surprising. The North Pacific was chosen as our end member of really low flux. Um, but this is another way to get at that CO2 estimate. Once we have the final biomass, I'll be able to take those respiration equations, plug them in, and compare those numbers to see whether, how well our three methods uh, meet. And so what I want you to take away from this idea is that there's been advances in technology that are increasingly easy to use that are allowing us to move beyond just day minus night, apply some scaling coefficients. And the ones I think that we can use really well are optical systems. They allow imaging of zooplankton, vertical size class. They tell you a lot about flux, and they tell you a lot about the midwater, which I argue is a very understudied region. One of the hurdles to this right now is the density of organisms in Bermuda. We were talking about putting UVPs on our um, CTD, but like you see one organism every blue moon, pretty much, in the open ocean. Um, so it depends upon what your system's like, whether it's gonna be super valuable or not. Um, the other problem is, is once you get all these images, somebody's got to tell you if it's a salp or a, a ketignath or a copepod or what. We're getting better at that. There's machine learning algorithms, but it's still a major struggle um, because you don't want your highly trained PI spending three weeks sorting plankton visually on a machine. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, we're working on it. <laughs> but another thing I wanted to mention is that respiration rates at current environmental conditions uh, are becoming easier to do. When I started my PhD with bread, we had the most annoying oxygen meters. Like, they consumed the oxygen. They consumed the oxygen as you measured it. You're like, oh my god. Um, and things have gotten better. Things have gotten better. Okay, they're not perfect, but the optical sensing technologies are a massive improvement. Um, and it's becoming possible to even do this sort of routinely. At ASLO, Russ Hopcroft, who's um, working on the new LTER in Alaska, said he's been chaining up, daisy chaining up these little 24 well plate oxygen things and just routinely measuring the oxygen consumption of copepods. It's like, oh, that's awesome. Ah, it's good stuff. Um, and it's not that, okay, it's expensive, but it's a one-shot investment. And then, and then we're getting more data, right? And we can actually use that to, to see how effectors are model avails and more importantly, figure out when and why they're not working. So. That's my, my plug for time series. We should be thinking about more things. And what's cool is that once you get this kind of information, you can start making flow charts of carbon through the system. Through um, previously known things, you can go from respiration rate, food availability to ingestion, egestion, respiratory loss, flux, and see how that matches up with traps in the water column or thorium measurements. Um, and so that's where we're going. That is the end of topic one. Does anyone have any specific questions about that part? Uh, yes. Uh, you mentioned that the respiration rate was higher than expected yes. in the low oxygen zone. Is that beneficial for the organism? And do you see it in other uh, areas or other organisms? I actually don't think that it's higher. 
I think it has to do with the fact that our scaling coefficient doesn't do a good job of constraining what's going on with those organisms. I think it has a little bit to do with the particular physiology of those organisms, the timing of when the cruise was there, the food availability while well, the food was there. So I think it's just that the, um, the scaling numbers that were put in were not appropriate for the region. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on to this. That DOC that I was making can also be called DOM, so dissolved organic carbon or dissolved organic matter, metabolites, um, is the dissolved phase uh, that is released from organisms that is carbon-based, so we're not talking about ammonia urea, we're talking about carbon-based components that are drifting out. We've always known that it's there, we don't really know what it is, we don't really know if it matters. Um, and so, as part of a collaboration um, in Bermuda that's called Bioscope, we have um, people with expertise in metabolomics, which is the analysis of compounds in the dissolved phase, uh, a lot of microbial people, physical oceanographers, some zooplankton people, We've even, we, we occasionally bring along even virus people and protists. Um, and we're all working together to try to understand diol patterns uh, in the um, processing of dissolved organic matter, um, and particularly how zooplankton mediate changes in the, in the prokaryotic community and this, this DOC pile. And so to give you a little bit of background on the information, so here's Bermuda. We're a lot further north than most people think. Um, this is a teeny tiny island. These are our time series. So we have one called Hydrostation and one called BATS. Um, Bioscope works within the BATS time series. Um, and so we can use all of their wonderful auxiliary data to contextualize things. We also have a glider system going on right now called the MAGIC program, which gives us 24-7 multiple times a day, understanding of the physical oceanography and how that relates to the process studies that we're conducting. And in this region, dissolved organic carbon, again, makes up about 24% of the carbon metabolized by zooplankton, which is from that Steinberg study. The active transport of carbon, which is the CO2 plus the dissolved organic carbon. If you talk about how important it is for flux, if you're looking in the top 150 meters, it's only 7.8, maximally during certain seasons, 38.6 of the, of the particulate organic carbon. That says that particulates are more important than respiratory carbon in that super up the upper water column, right? But if you go down just 150 meters to 300 meters, respiratory carbon becomes 71% uh, of the mean PCO2, right? So it becomes an increasingly important component of the transfer. This is in part because the organisms do migrate deeper and also has to do with the fact that that particular matter is getting attenuated, otherwise known as eaten, <laughs> as it goes through the water column. Okay? And so Deb um, et al. were looking at who's in the water column and this is the uh, total tow biomass and this is the biomass that is made up of these canonical migrators. Okay? So we have one krill in black and then Pleuromama ziphius in this dark gray, and then other Pleuromama in this light gray. So you can see that these, these Pleuromama copepods are an important biomass component of these active migrators that are moving in the water com column. And from our own data, we know that they move from the 50 to 150 meter lighter down to 450 to 600 meters every day. And this is what they look like. They're super cute. They're awesome to work with. They've got a little black dot right here, which is easy to see. And so you can collect them, shove them under the microscope. They need a little rostrum like this and two little hooks. Check Pleuromama ziphius. Um, and then you can do experiments with them. Because we know these guys are about 23% on average of the DVM biomass, we know that by working with them, we can scale to a community contributor that's actually relevant. Right? This is an important component of the vertical migratory community. So what they're doing matters. So what did we do? Um, we Threw a net in the water, collect some zooplankton at night, be it when they're at the surface. We take individual zooplankters, rinse, 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 deposit. Rinse, 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 deposit. Times 60 for each replicate. There's three replicates. Love those zooplankton. Then we let them excrete for some period of time. 9.5 to, I think, 16 hours was the longest that we let them excrete. And at the end of this time period, I take out all the copepods, I weigh them to know how much the biomass is, and then we take a portion of that water, we filter it, 
Um, and then we inoculate it with deep water community, prokaryotic community, unfiltered. Okay? So this is super clean water. There should be nothing in it, 0.2 micron filtered. Let the critters excrete. And then take that excretia, expose organisms from deep water to that excretia, and see what happens. Okay. And the way that we're measuring this is we're looking mass spectrometry to look at metabolomics, dissolved organic carbon, dissolved free amino acids. I'll explain more about that in a little bit. And then we're looking at the DNA, the community composition, cell counts for growth, dissolved organic carbon, and DFAA. And we let these sit for some period of time, let the community change and respond to the carbon that's in the water, and see what they do. Okay. So this is how much. So we ask DOM production, how much are they producing? So this is zero to 12 hours. We had the control, which should have nothing. We actually did a study of the carryover. So as I move the copepods from water to water, does that water end up contaminated with a little bit of something? Um, and you can see that our carryovers are pretty solid. Um, there's some enrichment of dissolved organic carbon, but not much. Uh, and then the green is the copepods themselves. So in this case, we have 58 copepods, um, which were about 0.33 milligrams per individual versus 56 copepods, which are about 0.37 milligrams per individual. And so they're producing a measurable amount of dissolved organic carbon. And if we compare these to the measured values from Steinberg, we're more or less in the same uh, range, slightly lower. But it's not just the kind of carbon, uh, the amount of carbon that's there, it's the kind of carbon that's there. When we talk about the midwater carbon, we tend to think of them as, again, they're getting leftovers from the surface water, right? They're getting the trash that nobody wants. It's coming down, it's not really good. They call it recalcitrant, Dom, okay? It's stuff that's hard to break down, um, and there's specialized communities in the water column who pull it apart, um, and it's not energetically really powerful carbon, okay? And so what we then this is deep water that we're starting with. We're going from low amino acids, so amino acids are rich DOM, to high amino acids uh, in this period. And if you talk about um, diagenetic state, which is just one of the measures of how crap the carbon is, that's my term, not the literature, um, you're getting a improvement in the quality of the carbon that's available within this water. Okay, so there is a starting carbon in this water, dissolved. It's coming from the midwater, and we're improving its quality over time. What is it more specifically? If we, um, I'm working with Liz Kaczynski's lab, I'm specifically with um, Brittany Widner, who's a postdoc with her right now, um, doing high-resolution dissolved organic matter analysis. I can't tell you that much about the metabolomics other than they pass it through a whole bunch of complicated machinery. They look at retention time, a bunch of fragments. They are looking at specifically targeted compounds. These are car compounds that they can actually identify and tell me how many they are there. Now, we've actually run this experiment three times, but we learned that duplicates is not so good. Singletons is really bad. So we've moved to triplicate. So in 2017, we did triplicate um, analyses. And what we were seeing is that the kind of things that are being excreted aren't just amino acids. They're things that are like vitamins, nucleosides, things that we would never think to be found in the midwater. We never measure it in the midwater because as soon as it shows up, somebody's like, oh, gosh, goody. I won the lottery. I've got a new vitamin. Um, so this kind of stuff is, is very difficult. There is high variability among biological replicates, and we haven't figured out why that is yet. The volumes that we need to use predicate that we have a whole bunch of organisms per treatment, and so I can't look at what kind of physiological variability in the organisms relates to this variability here. I might have picked all boys for one and all girls for another. Who knows? If you look at what this does to the community, this is now going from... We've just taken that uh, water that the organisms were inoculated in, and we've put deep sea water into it, and we're letting the community evolve. The number of prokaryotes, bacteria, plankton, in the water is being imaged by DAPI counts. And so we see increases in the community composition. The green in this case is, again, the copepod. The yellow is the carryover. The blue is control. There's some growth in the control and carryover, but it's comparable. There's substantial growth by like day five in the 
um, copepod treatment. And then over time, that community goes back to comparable to everywhere else. And what we're seeing in the dissolved organic carbon is that basically there's more DOC in these treatments, but they've eaten it all up by day five when that peak happens, right? So it can't support any further growth. They've used it all up. Again, they've used up all of that yummy DOC by day five. This is the um, DFA. That's supposed to be an F. <laughs> this is your uh, glasses test. It's an R and F. Tell me. Um, so we have obvious bacterial growth. DOC is not that large, um, but the label car carbon is used up pretty rapidly. OK, this is molecular data. For those of you who are freaked out by it, don't be. It's very easy, okay. sort of, now that we've gotten here. OK, this is prokaryotic response. Doesn't matter. What I have here is time 0, control copepod. Time 5, control carryover copepod. Time 8, control carryover copepod. OK, so these ones are our blank and our carryover control, right? Yeah. So they look the same, good. They look the same, good. These are our treatments, OK? This is the starting community. If you take water from 200 meters, the starting community is made up of these organisms noted by color. So what we're seeing is classic canonical Sargasso Sea midwater organisms. SAR for Sargasso 11, SAR 202, OK? Um, making up a lot of what's going on, SAR 202. There's people out there on this boat, this is the only thing they talk about is SAR. I've learned so much about SAR. After five days, the community composition has drastically changed. It's important to note that the community composition in the controls has also drastically changed. This is because there's a bottle effect, there's a little bit of a contamination. We know in these circumstances that in small volumes, weed species flourish. Okay? Alteromonas, which is this yellow one, flourishes. Right? Because it's bigger, it can chop down all the other things they can't get away because it's a there's, it's small bottle. Um, however, the day five and day eight composition by the copepods is distinctly different. So they have statistically different flavobacteria and rhodobacterialis. Okay? They have a different community. This says to me, if you think about a zooplankton swimming down in the water column, it's moving into the dark and into the depth where there's this crappy DOC, it is then excreting this burst of lovely high label compound. It's creating a pocket, a niche, high quality carbon. And then when it leaves, that region has a different prokaryotic community than the surrounding water. This increases niche diversity in the region. Another way to look at this statistically is cluster differently. They do control and carry over over time or over here. This is initial starting conditions, and the copepods are there. Over time, Alteromonas drags everything this way. This is a, a um, principal components, no, principal coordinate analysis. Yes, thank you. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, so I can say that this <laughs> describes 48% of the variation, but 25.9% of the variation is described by this variation in what's happening with the copepods. And that's changes, decreases in uh, SAR-202, SAR-11, and um, increases in these flavobacteria and rhodobacteria. Cool. Those ones. OK, so things to consider. I also did the experiment in shadow water communities. The shallow, so inoculating with shallow water, those communities change some, but they already always have a lot of good carbon, and so they didn't respond substantially. They, statistically, they responded, but not as profoundly to uh, the inoculation with zooplankton um, excretia. And, and like, let's be honest, I use 200 meter water as my deep. That's not deep water, right? And we know that the zooplankton are migrating down to like 450 to 600 meters. So I would love to do this again with truly deep community and see how that changes things. And excretia likely varies with zooplankton phylogenetics. So we did, a, we, just for fun, maybe because I love them, we tossed a pteropod in a DOC vial and measured how much it produced. One pteropod is like 16 times more dom than copepods, which makes total sense. If you've ever seen a pteropod, they're gooey everywhere. It's a snail, right? There's just like, it's not. Um, so I want to do more with them. And this is considering the DVMers, which is important biogeochemically. But there's all of those midwater zooplankton down there. Yes, they're not consuming the, the, the 
food in the surface, but I'm sure they're still peeing, and they're going to be consuming particles and releasing that in the midwater too. So thinking about what those midwater organisms are doing to create more high labile quality DOM for these midwater communities is important. And that's not just the sloppy feeding of nom, 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 cookie monster style. Um, and we typically think about the midwater as specialized prokaryotic community in this recalcitrant DOM. But there's things happening here, increased niche diversity. And it's not easy to measure these labile compounds because they are so quickly taken up by the water column. We don't measure them. Or do we? This is super exciting to me. We have Liz Krzywinski, who is doing profiles of the water column, looking at these metabolomics. And what I'm showing you, and we now actually have a third year of data, is you've got um, time, the pink arrows are when you have sunrise, basically. Um, and you have these traces of a compound showing up in the surface waters at night and then moving down into the water during the depth. And it gets used up. That's also one of the ones that was statistically significantly produced by mycopopods. So this might be a marker of DVM zooplankton that is being consumed by the prokaryotic community. Um, and we can see it live. Super excited, trying to write this manuscript for like a year working on it. Questions about this particular topic, that particular topic? We'll just look at this beautifulness a little bit longer. <laughs> I, was, I was so excited. And when we got the third year of data, Liz said I was allowed to publish it, and like I went over the moon. Yes? No? Okay. And finally, the last topic that I'll be talking about, less developed because, well, you'll see, um, physiology of migration and why it might matter. Okay, so we have these zooplankton, they move down during the day, they come back at night. And what I want to know is, does this migration matter? Do these organisms have natural circadian rhythms? And what does that potentially mean for the way that we calculate the contributions of these organisms and how we think about these systems overlapping zooplankton, prokaryotic community, midwater uh, structure? So how do we do this now? Classically, we take surface caught animals, we put them in a bottle for some period of time. We always write that down, 8 to 24 hours, and then we integrate basically divide by how long we had them, and this is our hourly late. So we put them in a bottle, we keep them there for 12 hours, divide by 12, that's the rate at which organisms breathe, excrete, whatever. Is it a dark bottle? Yes. Then we say, okay, uh, this was all done at surface conditions, let's take it to depth, we're just going to apply the effect of temperature using a Q10, um, sometimes we think about the oxygen, most of the time nobody bothers, um, and then we apply that to the biomass measurement, calculate flex for the period, and call it good. If you think about migrating thousands of body lengths a day, you might think that perhaps that could be energetically expensive, and that might change your oxygen demand during certain peak times. So canonically, we do it this way. It's very plausible that during the period of migration, they have higher metabolic rates when they're moving through the water column. And it's possible that in the surface, they're zooming around trying to catch prey, eating their food, so they've got a higher metabolism. While at depth, we can, again, we have this idea that they're, they're, um, they're, just, they're just contemplating their belly buttons. They don't have them. Right, they're just down there chilling out because there's not a lot of food down there. This is their bedtime, right? And so, these pro processes should be happening. If you have something like this, this is a daily process that is predictable, often it's matched with something, circadian rhythms, our clock system. And we know that these organisms do have the molecular machinery for a clock, okay? If they can expect that at night there's no food and then they're just hanging out at depth and there's not worth anything doing, why wouldn't they go to sleep, close down, shh, quiet out? Um, and this is one of the things that I was really interested in when I came to Bermuda and started testing with some pilot projects. What I know from the circadian literature is that organisms not only uh, eat during certain times of day, use the restroom during certain times of day, sleep during certain times of day, their physiology changes and they sequester certain 
behaviors to different times of day. So this is um, theorized and slightly supported hypothetic krill circadian metabolic pathway. And they have some idea that during this time period you're doing glycogen synthesis. Here's fatty acid synthesis. Glycogen metabolism happens here. Gluconeogenesis happens here. These processes are occurring. You eat and then metabolism happens. And it happens in a very predictable way. What's interesting about that is that there's different end products, like I went out and had a steak with Brad last night, which means that I had a lot of nitrogen that I was getting rid of because it was a very high proteinaceous event, right? And that's happening at a discrete time point. If I then sleeping and not eating anything, I wake up, I have a donut, the kind of, I did, it was delicious, um, then the excretion that I have after that is going to be quite different, right? And so there's potential changes in oxygen to nitrogen ratio, and likely the nitrogen sources that are released. There could be, in relationship to these migratory patterns, burst excretion of anaerobic or aerobic um, waste. And it should influence things like antioxidants. There should be circadian proteins that go up and down. So these are the kinds of molecular machinery that I want to look at and then link back to biogeochemistry. So what did I do? I specifically was looking for circadian effects in respiration rate. So this is how I did it. Basically, same respiration experiments with these gorgeous new spots that can continuously monitor oxygen, looking for changes in rate over time. And then with the migration effects, I was looking at the proteome. But because this was a pilot project, I was working on a small boat. The only time points I collect organisms was when they're at the surface. So I collected them in the middle of the night when they've been hanging out, and then right after they'd come to the surface, uh, right after migration. And so flash froze the critters, I generated a transcriptome, and then what we did is something called discovery-based proteomics. And this is working with Emma, Tim, and Schiffman um, at, at UW. Okay, so respiration rate. Uh, there is a circadian rhythm in the respiration rate of copepods. It takes a very small volume of water, really good temperature control and patience, and then smoothing. Uh, <laughs> but you can get uh, a respiration rate over time. Note, their respiration rate is declining over the course of three days. They have no food, they're in a small volume of water, they hate it. They're alive at the end, but there is a decline that has to do with captivity. However, if you take this um, statistically and you look at it, the peaks and troughs do exist, um, and they are uh, on a close to a 24-hour cycle. So they have a peak at dawn. What's really weird about these guys is their lowest point was at night when we'd expect them to be chowing down at the surface. Still working on that. I think it might be because they're midwater detritivores. Hand waving. <laughs> they're midwater what? Detritivores. They detritivores. eat. Yeah. Um, there's some other studies that tend to show peaks near dawn and dusk for other migratory copper, copepods. The nadir point seems to vary among species. Okay. Owls are nocturnal. Pigeons are diurnal. Perhaps copepods have variation. There are sure a lot of them, so it makes sense that they would. What's important is that this is one of the first studies who's then taken this idea that there's a circadian rhythm. We, that, that's not new thoughts. What I've done, though, is I've then taken that and scaled that up to the biogeochemistry. And since this is one of the major migrators, if you don't account for this circadian rhythm, you could underestimate the contributions of flux by 6 to 24% because they have higher metabolism during the day when they are at depth. One of the really bummer things about this is almost no paper that measures respiration rate mentions what time you started. None of them. None of mine. <laughs> Nobody knows. They start at some point after you catch them. So we can't actually go back into the literature and really look at this. So that means we have to go forward. Proteomics results. Okay, if you've never seen a plot like this, this is just taking the protein expression of each individual. You um, compare them with each other doing um, Pearson correlation. Oh, what is the name of it? Bray Curtis similarity matrix. Thank you. Um, and you cluster them. If they have more similar relationship, they're closer together. So all you can say is that the green ones tend to fall higher, the blue ones tend to fall lower. And that's. Uh, Significant, it's like a P of, yeah. Okay, it's not statistically significant. I will get a larger N. 
So um, you have variations in the physiology of these organisms. We were able to identify proteins. We can use this technique is basically what this, this is saying. Um, they do cluster by time of capture. And when I start looking at what's happening, 8 p.m., they've just arrived at the surface. They have increased oxygen transport. They show antioxidant activity. They uh, have more investment in reproductive effort and like way more bioluminescence, which I thought was interesting. In three in the morning, they've been hanging out in the surface water, chowing down for a while. They have more metabolic proteins. These are consistent with carbohydrate, lipid, and general oxidative metabolism. And then they have some proteins indicative of recovery from oxidative stress. So we are seeing distinct patterns in proteins during different time points. So one thing that was a little bit of a bummer about this, but I should have figured it out because I know a lot about circadian rhythms, is that proteomics is not the best approach for looking at circadian markers because they're transcriptomically and post-transcriptionally modified. And they happen on time scales that are a lot faster than protein um, degradation and creation. But it does sh show gross changes in physiology. And the project sort of overall suggests that there's something interesting here, but to really get at it, you need to do every six hours rather than just the night time. And we need to uh, pair things like gene expression proteomics with these biogeochemical components, respiration, dissolved organic matter, urea, ammonia, all these things. And NSF thought it was a good idea too. <laughs> and so uh, this is why there's less data in this study is that in May, we are going out to see the, to do just that sort of experiment. So we have this one cruise, it's gonna be four days. We are gonna just sample the blazes out of these guys every six hours, try to look for pulsing, try to see when are they releasing that DOM? Is it the same kind of DOM in the surface as it is at depth? When are they releasing urea? Copepods, which I did not know, this is what you get from having a copepod taxonomist for a husband. They have bladders, they're in their heads. Clearly, why wouldn't you put that there? Um, but for me, what that says is if you have a bladder, you're not just dribbling nitrogen out left and right all the time. You have a bladder, you hold on to it, you, you excrete at one point. Where is that point? Is that on the surface or is that at depth? That makes a lot of difference for whether <laughs> nitrogen is recycled, regenerated, or is lost. Um, we're also trying to look at some of the other components that contribute to this. How much you fed, how temperature at depth affects things, and how other species responding. So when originally when I posited this, it was just ammonium. Um, my bioscope collaborators have come on board and added dissolved organic carbon urea and metabolomics. I'm so excited. She has this new um, technique that lets me use two milliliters <coughs> of water. And I, that means I can actually measure the metabolomics from a single copepod. Do you know how cool that is? It's really cool. Okay, so back up. Big summary. What I'm trying to convey to you is that with new technologies, we can understand zooplankton contributions to the biological pump. Um, we should recognize that the midwater environment really does influence migration and is going to change biogeochemical cycling. And then we should be thinking more about the functional biodiversity of zooplankton. If phytoplankton people get to have five boxes in the model for phytoplankton, we should have at least two. <laughs> I would really like it if we had like six. But I'm willing to debate over which functional diversity terms we need to include. And they may be different for different parameters. The midwater may have other important label sources of carbon in the zooplankton of both the migratory and resident um, species. And this increases niche complexity. And this, you know, this concept that the midwater is just this barren desert that you know, they just get everybody else's bones is not necessarily entirely accurate. And this could be increasing carbon and nitrogen cycling and the complexity of our understanding of what's happening there. And furthermore, that circadian rhythms are super cool and exciting and potentially important for our understanding of zooplankton. Um, and depending upon those particular organisms can either bring up or bring down our estimates of, of flux and different excretia in different places in the water column. So <coughs> this is your take home message. They're really cool. You should love them whether you're a physicist, chemist, or biologist or general member of the public. And with that, this is my funding. I've gotten to the point where I have too many collaborators to show pictures of them, but they're all lovely people and I adore them. And this is what I have been up to.